And it looks like we're live on Facebook for all of our uh, folks and folks uh, out of town joining us today. Welcome to you. Uh, we're glad to be here on this Lord's Day and uh, have special guests with us, uh, Manny and Erica, and uh, so so uh, pleased to have them be able to share with us. And I know you were blessed, a wonderful couple working together, uh, blessing others through the gift of music and, and uh, other creative arts that they use to uh, spread the good news of Jesus. We're continuing our study called uh, Restored Identity. And if you have your Bibles with you this morning, uh, I would encourage you to join me in 1 Peter. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 2 is where we're going to be spending most of our time this morning. And you can join us in your Bible, or if you have your smartphone or other electronic device, you can join us on the Version Bible app. And under the events section, you'll find First Christian Church of Seminole, as well as the scriptures and the outline there that you can follow along as well. Just who do you think you are? <laughs> That's the, that really is the gist of the question we've been asking ourselves over the last several weeks. Who do you think you are? And, and one of the reasons we gather together, together every week is so that we can remind each other and be reminded from God's word of who we really are. And, and this study called Restored Identity is all about reclaiming that identity that God has given to us. And we've been looking over the last several weeks at some of the terminology that God uses, some of the names that he gives to us to tell us exactly who we are. We've learned that God sees us as saints in Jesus Christ. We've studied how the New Testament description of what it means to be a slave of Jesus Christ. And last week, we considered the fact that we need to adopt this mindset of being aliens, strangers, foreigners here in this world in which we live. And so we, we recognize we're citizens of another kingdom. Uh, and so I want to begin my thoughts today with the story of a family that went to church one Sunday and afterwards they went out to eat. And the father asked the little six-year-old boy to say the prayer, say the grace for the meal. And so he bowed his head and he prayed, Dear God, we had a great time at church today. You should have been there. <laughs> now, that little story raises an interesting question, and that is, how many people go to the house of God not expecting to be, not expecting God to be at home? And when I speak about the house of God, I'm not talking about this building. I'm talking about us. We are the house of God of rock. See, we've been in this series looking at our identity in Christ and part of knowing who we are is understanding where God is. <clears throat> and I think you'll um, you'll see what I mean as we read our text for today. 1 Peter chapter 2, and actually Peter's going to give us a lot of new words this morning for our identity, but I think they all have one common theme that ties them together and it'll become obvious to you as we read this passage together first peter chapter 2 beginning in verse 4 peter says and as you come to him the living stone rejected by men but chosen by god and precious to him you also like living stones are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to god through jesus christ for in scripture it says, see, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become a capstone and a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message which is also why, uh, what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Now, all through the text, I, I hope you were able to pick it up there. There's this 
general construction theme, isn't there? Peter calls us living stones. And then he talks about how we're being built into a spiritual house. But what does all of that mean? Well, let's start with this spiritual house metaphor. That means that God has chosen us to be his new home. Now, you remember when the children of Israel came out of Egypt and God brought them to Sinai and, and he used the words that Peter uses. God called his people a holy nation. He called them a nation of priests, a chosen people that belonged to him. So now Peter takes all of those words right out of the Exodus story and applies them to the church. He says, you are the new Israel now. And you remember that when they were at Sinai, it was God's idea to have his people build him a house. It was a temporary structure because they were going to be wandering for many years, but they called it the tabernacle. And they would set it up whenever they uh, set up camp so that God's presence could dwell among them. Now they knew, they understood, just like we understand, you can't contain God in any one space. He's omnipresent. He is present everywhere. But in some special way, God wanted to locate his presence among his people. So he said, build me a house. So in the Old Testament, they made God a sanctuary. But now in the New Testament, Peter says, you are the sanctuary. Look at verse 5 again. He says, now God is building you as living stones into his spiritual temple. We're not the future home of God. We are currently the house of the rock. Because God has chosen today, as he did in uh, the days of the Exodus to locate his presence wherever his people congregate. Now, I don't fully understand this, but God says where when my people come together, I choose to demonstrate my presence there. Paul said in 1 Corinthians, whenever an unbeliever comes into your assembly, they should fall down and say, God is in this place. He says in chapter 3 of 1 Corinthians, don't you realize that all of you together are the temple of God and the spirit of God lives in you? God will destroy anyone who destroys this temple for God's temple is holy and you are that temple. So yes, you can be with God alone in your prayer closet, but there is something special that happens when we all gather together because God chooses, because we are his house to be with us when we're together. And you know what I'm talking about. You can all think of those times when you've come to a church and you've gathered together with other believers in Christ and you've said afterwards, man, I just felt the presence of God in that place today. Amen. And that should happen every time we get together because God loves to locate wherever his people congregate. Now, it's not that we're so special because honestly, I know most of you and you're not that impressive, okay? <laughs> that's, that's not why God chooses to live among us. Notice Peter did not say you're a choice people. He said you are a chosen people. It's only because of the mercy of God that we can now be not just in his house, but we can actually be his house. Now that leads right into the second metaphor that Peter uses, and that is he calls us living stones. You see, we're a chosen people, and God hasn't stopped choosing. And living stones indicates that God is still building his house. Now that's a wonderful illustration because we don't think of stones as being alive, do we? We think they're inanimate objects. In fact, uh, we even say someone is as cold as a stone. Stones are a metaphor for death. Well, we were all once dead in our sin. We were lifeless to God, but Jesus came along and made us alive through our union with him. And now we are living stones. 
with a purpose to serve Jesus Christ. And what is that purpose? Why does Christ need living stones? Because Christ is building a church. He said, I'm going to build my church. And the gates of hell are not going to be able to stop my building it. You see, it's interesting to me that the Bible says the essence of, the, of our spiritual adversary, the devil, he's a destroyer. He comes to kill and destroy, to tear down and ruin. In contrast, Jesus is a builder. He creates. He builds people. He builds a church. And so I don't think it's a coincidence that he was a carpenter before he became a preacher. Jesus is a builder. And builders need material. And Jesus says, I'm going to build my church. Well, how are you going to do that? Well, he's going to use you as a living stone to be a part of the temple he's creating. Now, in heaven, he's building a house for us there. But here on earth, he's building a home for God. And you are one of those stones. So every time somebody embraces the gospel, someone who is previously dead in their sin, but they embrace Christ, it's like he quarries them out of that pit of sin and takes them and puts them into the temple. And what's interesting about Jesus is that most architects, when they build a building, they all want the stones to look alike, don't they? They want there to be some uniformity. All the stones have to be roughly the same shape, the same color, whether it's brick red or, or black or whatever. But Jesus quarries stones out of every possible quarry on earth. Every ethnic quarry, every economic quarry. He's got black stones and white stones, old stones and new stones, rich stones and poor stones. And he puts them all together and makes the most beautiful building you could possibly imagine. Paul talks about this in Ephesians chapter 2 and he says, Together we are his house, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. And the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. We are carefully joined together in him, becoming a holy temple for the Lord. Through him, you Gentiles are also being made part of this dwelling where God lives by his spirit. See, there was a time when the Jewish people would have said, hey, we are God's house. We're the only stones that God is using to build that. Paul says, not anymore. Jesus is going all over the world. And from every tribe and every nation and every tongue, he's getting stones to build his home for God. And the gates of hell are not going to frustrate that design of Jesus. But I think we have to be honest and say, well, you know, it kind of seems like at least in this country, the construction process has has slowed down somewhat. You understand North America is currently, if you, did, if you don't count Antarctica, is the only continent in the world today where Christianity is, is pretty much stagnant. God's house is growing and, and uh, God is adding stones all over the world, but it seems like here the building process has slowed quite a bit. Why is that? Well, I think our text raises several possible questions to give us some clues as to why that may be the case. Number one, we should ask, are we having foundational problems? I think all over the country, temples are trying to be built without a cornerstone. See, back in Peter's day, everybody knew that the first thing a builder had to do was find a capstone or a cornerstone. It's the stone that gives the direction and the design for the rest of the building. If the cornerstone is wrong, the entire building will be unstable. You have to have a solid, sure cornerstone. So don't you think it's interesting then that in a recent poll that appeared in USA Today, they asked 35,000 Americans who claimed they were Christians. And 83% responded, I'm not sure that Jesus is the only way to God. There are probably a lot of ways to God, and Jesus is just one of them. 83% of those surveyed who claim to be followers of Christ. 
57% of the people who said they were evangelical said, I'm not sure Jesus is the only way to God. No wonder the Church of Jesus Christ in North America is not growing. We've got serious foundational problems. We're not even sure who the cornerstone is. Peter was sure. Look again at verse 4. You are coming to Christ, who is the living cornerstone of God's temple. He was rejected by people, but chosen by God for great honor. See, Peter understood that neutrality is not an option. Jesus is either the cornerstone and the foundation of the church, or he's a stumbling stone that causes men to fall. One or the other. There's nothing in between. That's why Peter would proclaim on the day of Pentecost, there is salvation in no one else, for there's no other name in all of heaven for people to call on to save them. You need to know that you're at a church today that absolutely is committed to Jesus Christ as our cornerstone and foundation. Yes. Neutrality is not an option here. We call on everyone in this room who has not yet embraced Christ to do so. And we're going to ask you to make a decision. And when you get to that point of making a personal surrender to Christ and you get in this baptistry behind me, we're going to ask you a question. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the son of the living God? And are you willing for him to be the Lord of your life? And if you want to be a part of this church, if you want to join this church, we're going to ask the question, have you committed your life to Jesus Christ and do you believe he is who he said he was the way the truth the life and that no one comes to the father except through him we don't apologize for asking those questions we believe it's through the resurrection that God made it clear he wants his home to be built on the foundation of his son that's why Paul would say later in 1 Corinthians 3, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one we already have, Jesus Christ. About 200 years ago, there was a boy who lived in England. His name was Edward Moat. You probably have not heard of him. He didn't grow up in a Christian home, but about at the age of 16, he came to Christ and was a fully devoted follower of Jesus. Uh, now his trade was a cabinet maker and he was a very skilled and uh, good builder, even helped build a, a church out in this little place called Sussex. And he did such good work that the people there wanted to deed him the property. He said, I don't want the property. I just want the pulpit. I want to preach Jesus. And as long as I preach Jesus, let me stand in that pulpit. And when I stop preaching Jesus, you take me out. And he stayed there preaching Jesus until one year before he died due to health complications. He, before his death, he said, the truth that I've been preaching, I'm now living upon. And they will do very well to die upon as well. Now, like I said, you probably not recognize the name of Edward Moat. You have, however, heard of one of his poems. He wrote a few songs that were later put to music, and one of them is one of our favorites. Listen again to just the first verse and realize that these words were written by a cabinet maker and builder. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. See, we are staking our eternity on the legitimacy of Jesus being that sure foundation. And if we're going to build the house of rock in this place, that is non-negotiable. And here's another question, though, we need to be asking. Not only are we having foundational problems, but are we doing our housework? Because like every good preacher, Peter mixes his metaphors. He says, you're not just passive stones. You're living stones, but you're also active servants in the house that God is building. Look again at verse 5. 
Now, in the first half of the verse, he says we're living stones. And then he says, what's more, you are God's holy priests who offer the spiritual sacrifices that please him because of Jesus Christ. So we're not just stones in the temple. We're priests who serve in the temple. In the Old Testament, God's people made God a sanctuary. In the New Testament, God's people are the sanctuary. In the Old Testament, God's people had a priesthood. In the New Testament, God's people are the priesthood. You understand that every single one of us who are followers of Jesus are priests in God's house. Now that has some important implications that we better not miss. Number one is that means that everybody here who is a devoted follower of Jesus, has equal access to God. Amen. You are a priest in the house of God. You have access to the Heavenly Father. You don't have to go through a guy wearing a funny collar. You don't have to pray to Mary or some other in between. You don't have to come to the preacher or any elder. Every single person who's a follower of Christ can go straight into the throne room of God because you are a priest. But then secondly, it means that every single one of us has something to do. Because you understand in the Old Testament, you didn't bring your offering directly to God. You took your sacrifice to the priest and the priest offered it to God on your behalf. But in the New Testament, you are the priest. That means you don't wait for other people to do it for you. You do it. You have housework to do. Everybody is a priest, and priest has something to do in the house. Let's be really clear about this, though. Unlike the priests in the Old Testament, you and I don't have to offer sacrifices for our sin any longer. Jesus took care of that once and for all. But there are still some sacrifices that every priest in the house needs to bring to God. Let me show you uh, just a few of those. One is the sacrifice of praise. Hebrews 13 says, through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that confess his name. Now, I think that means worship, but I think it means more than that. And a big part of worship is singing. And I'll just give you my personal bias here. I think worship in worship, I believe God is listening for a heart that is producing worship. And whenever you and I come together as the house of God, I believe God wants your heart poured out 100% in praise. Not just passively standing by watching somebody else do it. This is a sacrifice every priest should be bringing to God. The sacrifice of praise. Another sacrifice is your good works. The very next verse in Hebrews says, And do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. God expects every follower of Christ to be doing good and helping somebody around them. Another sacrifice the scripture talks about is our financial giving. In Philippians, Paul thanked the church for sending him financial assistance. And he says in verse 18 of chapter 4, I have received full payment and even more. I'm amply supplied now that I've received from Epaphroditus the gifts that you sent. They are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. Another sacrifice we bring to God are the people you and I introduce to Jesus. Paul writes in Romans and he says in chapter 15, I bring you the good news so that I might present you as an acceptable offering to God made holy by the Holy Spirit. See, we're priests in the house of God and priests are to stay busy. As priests, we're always on call in the house of the Lord. We should be bringing him our praise. We should be doing good works. We should be bringing others to Christ and offering our financial resources. The bottom line is we are offering our lives as a living sacrifice to God. Romans chapter 12 says, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he's done for you. 
Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. See, just like it's, it, it sounds uh, contradictory to say you're a living stone, Paul says you're a living sacrifice. That's what we are. Every day we die again. Every day we get back on the altar. Every day we pick up our cross and we deny ourselves. We are priests. And that's what we do. James Calvert was the very first missionary to the Fiji Islands. And uh, it was populated at the time by savages and cannibals and had not been reached with the gospel. And when the boat anchored off the island, the captain of the boat said to him just before he departed, Sir, you understand if you get off this boat, those savages will probably kill you. To which uh, James Calvert replied, Sir, we died before we came. When God is doing, is in building up his people, is seeking those who are going to help him rebuild his whole creation. And so I think there's one more thing we've got to ask ourselves. Why is the house of God not growing in our nation? Are we doing our housework? Are we, are we uh, having any foundation problems? And then I think we need to ask ourselves finally, are we keeping the lights on? I mean, nobody wants to go into a dark house. Why has God given us such a radical makeover? He's given us a new identity that through us, his identity might be made known. Look again at 1 Peter chapter 2 where Peter says, You're a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, watch this, so that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. That's our purpose, is to spread the light. See, ever since Genesis chapter 3, God has been the victim of the most malicious, slanderous propaganda campaign in the history of mankind. And you know what God wants? God wants a people who will go out and tell his side of the story. Most of the word on the street about God is distorted. And God has always wanted a people to whom he could say, now you go out and you tell them my side of the story. Every single week without fail, God sends someone to this church looking for truth, searching for something that is real. And we need to ask ourselves, have we kept the lights on or are they off? Paul said in Acts 20, but my life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for finishing the work assigned to me by the Lord Jesus. The work of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of God. God did not send us out to condemn people. He's not asking us to judge the world. He's just asking us to go out and tell people his side of the story. To declare his marvelous deeds. And when we do that, we declare that God's house is truly a habitat for all humanity. And that must be our mission. When Jesus called his disciples, you remember they put out a net, and there weren't any fish in it. And he told them to put it back down. And when they did, they drew up so many fish, their boats began to sink. And Jesus said to them, now guys, listen, because I'm going to teach you how to fish for men. Now don't you think the implication was, if I can use you to fill up a net of fish, then I can use you to fill up God's house with people. And you need to know something about God, folks. He doesn't just want a big house. He wants a big, full house. He even said so. In one of Jesus' parables, the master throws this big party, and he wants his, all of his friends to come, and he sends his servants out to invite people to his party, and one by one, they begin making excuses as to why they can't come, how they're too busy to attend. And so the servants come back and they say to the master, we couldn't fill up the place. So what's the master say? Go out to the roads and the country lanes and make them come in so that my house will be full. God wants a full house, folks. Our mission here in Seminole is to see as many possible, as soon as possible, by all means possible. 
to come into the house of God. That's our agenda because God wants a full house. There was an article a few years ago where they interviewed a man named Evan Hart, who's one of the last surviving uh, members of the Titanic disaster. Here's what he remembered the most. He said he was in lifeboat number 14, one of the very few that were full that night. He said he remembered being in the water in that boat, hearing the screams in the darkness of people in the water begging to be rescued and watching most of the other lifeboats who were not full simply ignore the pleas of those who were drowning. They only had 20 lifeboats on the Titanic. That was far too few. But even more tragic was that the great majority of lifeboats in the water that night were only half full. And the people in those half full lifeboats wouldn't go back out to rescue anyone else because of the fear that the folks in the water would swamp their boat. They didn't want other people to rock their boat. We do. We're the house of the rock. And there will always be room for more stones. Because that's who we are. Let's pray about that. Father, I pray that you would give us today a real passion to see your, your temple rise and, and grow and expand all over the world with stones from every tribe and every nation and every quarry chiseled out of the pit of sin and placed by Jesus into the house where your glory dwells. Help us, God, to recommit our confidence that Jesus is the foundation and that sacrifice is the way of life and that it is a blessing to tell your side of the story. And Father, help us to continue to open our own eyes to all the people who need to be in your house and help us to be willing to walk across the room to engage those people, to walk across the class, to walk down the hall, to walk across the park, across the street, next door, across the office. Whatever it takes so that your house will be full. We ask this because we're confident it will honor you and bring glory to your son Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. We always want to offer an invitation for those of you who have not yet made a confession of Christ. You've never submitted to a baptism into him. You've never buried that old person in a watery grave and been raised to walk in a new life with Jesus. This is an opportunity to do that. You can talk to us afterwards. You can call us through the week. We'll explain to you and sit down and love to talk to you about what the scripture says you need to do to be saved and be a part of this living uh, structure that Christ is building through each of us. God bless those of you who are watching online, and we'll look forward to seeing you here soon and back next week together. Have a great week.